with an introduction, and then basically most of the talk will be an overview over the standard model prediction of G minus two, where I will give you an update on the hadronic contributions because that's my expertise. And there are the hadronic vacuum polarization contributions. I will say a few words about light by light, but that would be really a separate talk. And do justice to this. So, but I will also give you a, a quick status report on the two new G minus two experiments, one at Fermilab and one at J Park, and uh, say possibly if time allows, say a few words about BSM solutions to the puzzle G minus two. So, as a motivation, I want to stress what probably everybody in the room knows, but uh, the standard model is uh, in a way too successful for most people's taste, and, but it stays incomplete. So we know that there are neutrino masses, so in the original version of the standard model they would have been left out, and the mixing points towards some high-scale gut physics. So in a way, lepton flavor violation is established in the neutral sector, but so far we haven't seen charged lepton flavor violation, or for that matter any EDMs. And uh, that uh, is not necessarily a natural thing in many scenarios for new physics where you would expect to see both. Both, well, for the EDMs, you would necessarily want uh, to have some, need some extra CP violation because what's provided in the standard model is uh, too small to give you anything visible. And uh, that's interesting because the CP violation that we have in the standard model is also not enough for the matter-antimatter meta asymmetry that is needed in, in order to, to make us possibility to exist. So in addition, we have the dark matter and dark energy problem. We need a lot of it to explain uh, cosmology. So uh, there are quite a few things that are not very satisfying in the standard model from the point of view of describing what we see, uh, apart from purely theoretical considerations. But uh, on top of that, there are a few hints that something is wrong or not explained in the data. And uh, the anomaly of the muon is, is one, of, one of the things that have uh, been sticking out for a while and it hasn't gone away. So a question is if there is a common new physics explanation for all these puzzles. And I think that the uncolored leptons, they could provide a particularly clean probe to establish and possibly constrain or even distinguish new physics scenarios. And they are, of course, very complementary to all the searches that are done at the LHC. So, so far, nothing has been seen, nothing new physics uh, has been seen at the LHC so far. And uh, this brings uh, some models like a constrained uh, minimal supersymmetric standard model uh, in trouble when one tries to accommodate all the LHC exclusion limits and at the same time use these quite popular BSM uh, extensions of the standard model to explain the puzzle that we will see in G minus two in a moment in more detail. So of course the question ultimately is if there is any TV scale new physics out there as was predicted by many people and is still hoped for uh, or is there some completely new low-scale physics in the game which uh, LHC possibly wouldn't be able to track down but for which a lot of other low energy experiments have been built recently and a lot of the parameter space is already ruled out also in this area. So I think uh, the key to provide uh, really an explanation of these things may lie uh, in a combination of everything. We may not be able just to, to find things at the high scale and uh, low energy observables could be these MDMs, so magnetic dipole moments, also electric dipole moments, and lepton, fly lepton flavor violation. So I wouldn't just claim that one observable where you just measure one number, you can't solve anything with that, you can discover and establish that something new must be there, but ultimately we need more observables to constrain things. So the introduction to the actual subject matter, so Dirac, uh, <coughs> Well, gave us, of course, not only the prediction that there must be antiparticles, but uh, a consequence of the Dirac equation is that uh, for a fundamental, 
spin one half fermion G is two. And uh, then small deviations were seen already in 1947. That was in hydrogen and deuterium hyperfine structure measurements. And uh, then people said, well, if we just put this factor GS a bit away from two, then everything would be fine. But of course, why would that be the case? And Schwinger provided uh, then actually a very elegant and nice explanation of this by calculating a one-loop radiative correction uh, to the prediction of two. So the deviation of G from two divided by two, that's then called the anomaly. That's his famous prediction engraved on his gravestone. Uh, this year is actually the 100th birthday of Schwinger. And Feynman. Uh, sorry? And Feynman. <laughs> and Feynman, yes. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> his motto was this one. <laughs> I think he was first with this one. Uh, and this explained the discrepancy and at the same time I think was a crucial step in the development of perturbative quantum field theory and specifically QED. <coughs> so, let's remember that the anomaly so the anomalous magnetic moment, it's a long term for it, uh, is just from the Pauli term. So the effective operator for the anomalous uh, magnetic moment here is uh, then something that includes a spin flip and uh, that has some natural scaling laws involved here. But importantly, from the theoretical point of view, this is a dimension five operator. So this is not part of the standard model. So it's not a parameter which you have to measure by measuring the anomaly and saying that's it, like uh, masses and charges. But uh, it's something that, uh, as it's not part of the fundamental QED, Lagr QED Lagrangian, it can still occur via radiative corrections and is therefore calculable in perturbation theory. But we'll see that perturbation theory is actually not enough to do that and there are non-perturbative contributions. So now I allow a few minutes taking a detour from the actual subject, which is the muon, to the electron. So why are we actually caring so much about the muon when we have such beautiful measurements of the electron's anomaly? So of course the leading order term for the electron just coming from one photon exchange, Schwinger's calculation. That's the same for all fundamental leptons. And uh, so that provides the ballpark of the numbers. But uh, down the line, there are some differences. I will come to that in a moment. First, let's see what the experiment has done. So for the muon, that is what happened at uh, Brookhaven before the ring was moved to Fermilab. More on this later. And the measurement was, uh, had an accuracy of 0.5 parts per million. And that is already a big achievement. But if we compare that, and that's not a typo, that is really the feature, uh, the anomaly of the electron is measured 2.24 parts per billion. And uh, this is uh, with a tabletop experiment. This is very, very nice physics. So people may ask, why is it then uh, useful to talk about the muon at all? If I'm 2,000 times more precise with the electron, then why bother with the muon? But the important thing to remember is that in these uh, loop contributions, the virtual photons enter, and uh, there is a particular scaling here with the mass of the outer fermion line, with the electron or the muon line, when it comes to contributions from particles which go around in virtual loops and therefore indirectly test new physics. So forget the new physics label, the same scaling is true for the hedronic contributions, where typically hedronic scales enter the game. But if we are chasing new physics, then this could be a new physics scale. So this dimensionless uh, number uh, would come with some coefficients calculable from all the loop calculations in higher orders, all sorts of other parameters of the standard model or BSM physics enters. But naturally, then there is a suppression scale of the lepton mass divided by the new physics mass, the whole thing squared. And this is where, of course, uh, 
the, the muon wins big time because it's much heavier than the electron. We have a factor of 43,000, which beats the 2,000 times more experimental accuracy. This is why people say, well, especially if we are chasing high-scale physics, and traditionally this has been the case, then the higher the lepton mass, the better. Why can't we go to tau? Well, the tau decays too quickly, and the form factor measurements done at uh, lab one and lab two, and at places uh, like with Bell, they are giving us constraints, but they are very poor when it comes to accuracies in the part per, per million level. Even in the future, Bell two will not be able to do such a great job on this. So. Two more slides on the electron, just because I think this is something very important. And so the structure of the electron standard uh, anomaly standard model prediction is the same as for the muon. So we'll have a QED part, a hadronic part, a weak part. And uh, so most important for the electron is uh, really the QED, also for the muon, but all the other parts are highly suppressed. So for reference, if people want to look it up or want to compare it later on, that may lead to too much detail for this talk, there are numbers given here. So the important thing is that uh, this now includes, and I will say a few words more when I'm coming to the actual standard model prediction of the muon, this includes heroic five-loop QED calculations now, QED calculation at five loop, that means that I have alpha over pi, then to the fifth, so this alpha is really of prime importance here. So I must use it from, I must use an alpha input from somewhere. Uh, in the past, that was done from measurements with rubidium atoms with a 0.6 part per billion accuracy. Uh, and uh, then you get a number, and this is uh, that number. And uh, that's one thing. Or you ca can turn things around and can say, well, I believe QED and the very small contributions from QECD and WEEK and uh, have a very nice measurement and uh, therefore derive alpha from it. And for a long time, this was the most precise way to get the fine structure constant. So both ways of thinking are possible. So in the past, it was really that AE measured and AE calculated determined alpha. Now, recently, people have measured alpha in a different way. They have uh, measured alpha with this fantastic accuracy of 2 times 10 to minus 10 using cesium atoms. And uh, if you put that into the formula, the standard model prediction of the electrons anomaly, then you get a value which is now actually quite a bit different from the measured one. Funnily, in this case, in the electrons case, the experiment now uh, is below the standard model prediction. We will see in the muon, it's the other way around. In the muon, we have to fill a gap and are trying to find new physics explanations. Here, it's the other way around. It got the anomaly has a minus sign. That is one specific new, very precise measurement. It will be very difficult to even better this. Maybe there is a way to check it. It's always the question if something comes up for the first time. But all the ingredients for the standard model prediction have been very well checked. So it's not above three sigma, it's but it's going in the other direction. So people are talking about having a new puzzle, a second puzzle, when it comes to the anomalous magnetic moment of uh, fundamental spin one half leptons. So let's see. So some people already have already written papers explaining both. So let's turn to the new one. So Back to the future. The whole story started some 40 years ago at CERN, and uh, then Brookhaven delivered uh, 
this 0.5 parts per million precision. And uh, the new experiments are happening already and finally should give us certainty about the discrepancy. So that's a snapshot of the older comparison. And I stole this plot from Fred Jäger in his book, who had as a motto, the closer you look, the more there is to see. I think this is a good motto for the precision physics community, because it's really true. You start with a rough 10% measurement, and that can be done on the back of the envelope. You, you work hard and get to a percent. And then you suddenly need a per mil and better. And uh, that is happening here. For the input cross sections, we'll see in a moment what I mean with this statement. So what's remarkable about that thing is that it's not been floating around with positive and negative anomalies. And basically, after it's stabilized, uh, I mean, that, that, that has been it, OK, for, for the theory predictions. And there was a hiccup when people got the light by light sign wrong. Some of you may remember that story. Well, people had uh, minus times minus times minus is still minus and got something wrong. And uh, so, yes, there was something. But st since then, it's really been a bit consolidated. The same happened then with uh, experimental measurements. And also, it's remarkable that uh, we don't see any time and any case of uh, CPT violation in, in the muon sector here by comparing the measurement of positive with the one of negative muons within errors. So that's the combined value. That's been there for quite a while now. Let's move a bit forward in history. That's uh, 2013. <coughs> there was a sort of mini white paper on uh, the archive uh, needed in order to make the case for the new muon G minus 2 experiment at Fermilab. And at the time, there were theory predictions. That was uh, that T, that's myself, uh, and that's uh, <coughs> Kauru Akiwara. That was Ru van Liao, a PhD student of mine at the time. That's Alan Martin, and that's Daisuke Nomura, KK. And uh, other people are uh, Michel Davier and collaborators. And uh, then we said, well, if we have a stand-up model prediction XX with a new label for the year when we do the work, and hopefully it will be better than what we had before and in some agreement, then we would have what uh, would be uh, what is in the moment, uh, three to four sigma discrepancy, then we could improve that to a 7.7 7 to 8 sigma discovery if uh, the experimental progress is as planned. So this is some theory at the time. And uh, this is the BNL result as it stands now for many years. And the experiments hope to improve that by a factor of four. So if the mean value stays, then we would bring the discrepancy to some concluding discovery, of course, not knowing what's in the loop. Of course, it could also be that the mean values get much closer to each other. And maybe that would then be a result not so much hoped for by some people. But I would actually say that this would be very nice, a very nice outcome in itself, because it would help us to put much stronger exclusion limits on a lot of models of beyond the standard model physics, which give a significant contribution in order to bring that theory value up to the experiment in order to fill that gap. So called it here the XXX version of the supersymmetric, uh, super supersymmetric standard model or something like that. It will never be completely dead, but uh, you can sort of <laughs> constrain it a lot. So that's the short commercial break. The US investing a bit of their money into the new G minus two experiment. They also wanted to make sure that the theory makes progress. And uh, people have been tasked uh, by uh, AIDA to have uh, a worldwide collaboration on the theory prediction of G minus 2. And uh, the first meeting was in June, close to Fermilab. Uh, we couldn't bring all the internationals in there because of uh, restrictions. 
going to an American laboratory, but that's another story. So it was held close to Fermilab, and uh, then in 2018 there have been a few meetings already, and uh, there will be more international meetings to come. So it's really uh, a big enterprise from various sectors of people doing theoretical calculations, including lattice, of course. Actually, that's the second part of my mini commercial. My ex uh, PhD student, Alex Keshavasi, and uh, and together with Daisk and myself, we have we have done basically our task. Uh, and I forgot to say the task was with that plot that uh, we want to bring the error down by about a factor of two. In order to really achieve that, if we and our, our bit has basically been delivered. I think there will be more bits to deliver, but that's a paper published in PRD this year. And uh, th that's our new baseline when it comes to the hadronic vacuum polarization contributions to G minus two. So that brings me to the term by term discussion of the stand up model contributions to G minus two. And these diagrams here are slightly different for electrons and for muons, but the calculation has been done for, for all by, by Kinoshita and collaborators. So I think that's, uh, that's probably the only group that for whatever quantity you look at has done the one loop, the two loop, the three loop, the four loop, and the five loop calculation of a physical observable in a realistic theory, not a toy model theory, in three plus one dimensions with everything in there. And uh, so that's, uh, I called it earlier on heroic because that's 12,672 diagrams with different mass scales involved. Well, it's not electroweak, it's not that bad, but it's still different fermion masses. And of course, muon and uh, originally the, the, the main line is muon or electron force. So they needed code generating code, including the renormalization, which had to be automized. And in the end, they ended still with multidimensional numerical integrations. And that, of course, comes with an uncertainty in itself. And if you have something like this, you want to have some checks. So let's look at what the numbers are. So Schwinger's result is uh, just this one in units of 10 to minus 11. I will later sometimes have 10 to minus 10. That depends on how people want to quote things. Two loop graphs still fit on one line. At three loop, you have already 72. At four loop order, 891 diagrams. You have seen a sample of, sample of the five loop ones. And uh, that's then the number Kinoshita and collaborators came up with. And uh, let's just see where the errors come from. So this is a fantastically precise number, specifically when you are looking at the errors that come from the theory here. That is the lepton masses, that is a very small input, uh, an uh, input error, because, uh, well, they are known very well. It's not that they're unimportant, but they are known very well. Then there is a for loop error. This is not a truncation error or anything like that. This is uh, coming from the numerical precision of the Monte Carlo multidimensional integrals. That's the one at the five loop, uh, percentage-wise that may be bigger, but uh, absolute-wise that is smaller. And the biggest error here by far is actually the input for the alpha, which uh, for that number was used from the rubidium measurements. But in total, that thing is fantastically accurate. And if you're looking at the structure of the power series in alpha over pi, uh, and then look at the coefficients, then yes, you see that there is a growth of the coefficients as somewhat expected from the factorial growth of the number of diagrams involved in this amplitude. But it's by far not beating the suppression of a fine structure constant divided by pi to the power n. Still, you may of course wonder, uh, what if somebody went wrong here? And after that came out, people did ask. They didn't say, Kinoshita, you're wrong. It's not like that. Nobody would uh, tell, tell Kinoshita san that he's wrong, but you want to be sure. So, and the good thing is that after a while, people worked very hard and came up with checks of the most important things and then the less important things and everything. Upshot here is, I can give it a green check mark because it's all fine. So, 
four loop and five loop diagram. Some of them uh, have, uh, have been independently checked. All four loop graphs with internal lepton loops are completed, com uh, are calculated completely independently. And then there was a very important and very impressive calculation. That's not a typo. So uh, Laporta came up with ideas to semi-analytically calculate the universal uh, term, which is very difficult to, to get by uh, with other methods unless you do the full calculation. And he got that to 1,100 digits. Okay? And it agreed with the much cruder numerics that the others had done before. Uh, and all agree basically within errors with Kinoshita. And Kinoshita, there were a few things where they improved, where they, uh, where they even found small mistakes in the setup. But nothing has really been changed dramatically, so QED is on safe ground. We move on to electroweak. Electroweak is known at two loop accuracy. And I had to update that slide, say a few words about this in a moment. Let's first look at the one loop. So one loop comes from W exchange, Z exchange, and Higgs exchange. Higgs exchange, as you may expect from the very small Yukawa couplings, is completely negligible if you can read that from behind. That's 10 to minus 14, whereas the Z and the W exchange are of the order 10 to minus 10 with a very important cancellation between terms. So the one loop result is 195 in units of 10 to minus 11. And the two loop, you needed already 1650 diagrams. And that was probably the first electroweak two loop calculation for a physical observable, as far as I'm aware. And that was done some long time, ago, not so long time, but long time ago by Czernetsky, Krause, Marciano, Feinstein, Knecht, Paris, Perotet, and De Raphael in different frameworks. And they sort of agreed to a number, and that was before the Higgs mass was known, so there was an uncertainty in the Higgs in here. So a two loop, the Higgs enters in different ways and becomes important. And uh, so later, uh, Dominic Stöckinger and collaborators updated that number with the knowledge of the Higgs mass, and that's the value we are using now. That percentage-wise has a significant uncertainty, if you wish so, but absolute in absolute terms, this is a small uncertainty. Later on, when we come to hadronic contributions, we will look at contributions in units of 10 to minus 10. Now, nothing should remain unchecked. So, I was quite happy to see that the uh, Japanese group has uh, now done a two-loop electroweak uh, calculation again, based on heavy numerics and automation by the package grace combined with form. And in the previous calculations, in order to deal with the different mass scales and their large hierarchy, between the fermion masses and the boson masses of W and Z bosons, they had uh, applied a heavy mass expansion. And that leads to massive theoretical simplifications of the underlying loop integrals, but of course it's an approximation ultimately. And you can't drive it easily much further. So, so what they, what these guys did, they, they were beating the numerics to death. And there are all masses fully in. And it's a very recent result. It has not gone through the refereeing process yet. But still, I want to cite it here. So the two-loop weak contribution, which brought the 195 from the one loop down to the values quoted here, that has now gone a bit less negative. So it's a shift up by 6% of that contribution, which is a bit outside the errors. I'm not sure to which extent. I would have to look up the old papers. To which extent that one really included the estimate of having used the heavy mass expansion. So you have to take things always with a, with a pinch of salt here. So it's not drastic, but it's good that this has been double checked. And even better, we have a value that is, uh, that is now more reliable. I think actually, I think actually that this here is that this here is wrong because they got it more precise. That's a typo when I just updated dated the slide a moment ago. So that brings us to hadronic. So the problem is 
and the beauty for us, because it means more interesting work to be done, is that this is non-perturbative. Why is it non-perturbative? The photon that in one loop in the Schwinger calculation goes round with a typical virtuality prefers to have low virtualities. At low virtualities, that loop here can't be approximated by a quark loop because all hadrons contribute in the spectrum. And the spectrum is, of course, something that is not perturbative. QCD, the hadron spectrum at low, low energies. So the uncertainties involved in these contributions are massive compared to all the other uncertainties. So unless you think that something has got completely out of hand and is wrong, and I hope I have convinced you that people have checked everything in electromagnetic and weak contributions, then it's really, when you want to get precision, you need precision in these guys. So the classification is vacuum polarization, that's when two photons are attached. Light by light, that's when four photons are attached. Because if you cut out the muon line and twist one leg around, it's a process, two photons in, scattering hadronically, two photons out, so that we call light by light scattering. The, ve the hadronic vacuum polarization comes in leading order, next to leading order, and next to next to leading order, I will show a slide in a moment, so where you just have extra photons going around, but keep the two-point function, the hadronic vacuum polarization, the main <coughs> hadronic object here that influences your g minus two. So NLO, NLO perturbatively would be three loops. Okay. Yes. So so see that as a quark loop, then that is two loop, that is three loop, that is also three loop. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. So they are the same, counting wise, but where but we can get this very precisely the moment we can get this very precisely, where it's this is a beast. So let's say a few words about the beast then. So it's my one-page summary, otherwise that would really be a separate talk. Sorry. Concentrate on this for the moment. What is it in terms of physics? The underlying physics here is that you have two photons going into two photons. So the main exchange mechanism here is that there are some pseudoscalars, pi zero and eta. Now, that cross here indicates the external field. That's the external field photon. That's the approximation that our muons couples to the external magnetic field used to keep the muon on the ring orbit. But these photons here have all loop momenta, so they ha can have all sorts of possible virtualities. And that makes it a real beast, because we do not even know very well how the pion couples to two photons when it comes to real photons, let alone when you make one virtual or when you make two virtual. And this is what you would need. So therefore, you can do model calculations for these guys, but you rely on form factors, which are poorly known. You can use form factor constraints and perturbative QCD constraints, but it's still only a model calculation. So in the past, people, notable scientists, said that you will never get this, and therefore we shouldn't invest in any experiment, and that was basically also one of the reasons why Brookhaven was never allowed to measure to their statistical uh, limit. They were still dominated uh, by statistics when they had to stop because some people in US uh, said to politicians, you can never have a firm interpretation because they can never calculate it. Okay? So I think that's wrong. Certainly wrong with the big progress that has been done recently. There are very good news from Lattice QCD, who simulate that thing in various ways now. And uh, it's not yet at the precision level. There's no firm number for everything to report. But the bits that we understand now all point into that, the direction that uh, the, what is, has been sold as the Glasgow consensus of model builders doing cal model calculations for this by modeling this and brothers and sisters of them. Uh, is a quite reliable number. The error estimates here you may debate, but I'm sure that, and there are also dispersive approaches. Some people said, I come to the dispersive approaches for the vacuum polarization in a moment. Some people said, you can never calculate that with dispersion relation, but they were wrong. I mean, the Swiss group uh, with people from Bern, they have now impressive results showing, uh, showing leading bits being spot on. So the take home message here 
is uh, that the first results that we have seen using different approaches seem to confirm that number and it's clear that the number will be improved. So the politicians and skeptics should be convinced that it really can be predicted. And for the time, we use this number which has percentage-wise a huge error, but with where some people claim that this could be 200 you know, or 300 mean, and I would say no, definitely can't. 10 units here is 10 to minus 11. It's next to leading order. <laughs> so that brings me to the main part where, where I have contributed with that paper with Alex and, and Daiske. And uh, that's the leading order and next to leading order ones. But before going into detail, let's say that uh, Matthias Steinhauser and collaborators, they have used our data input because we will use data input for that and uh, have then produced the NNLO number for this, which is also a, quite a calculation because you have to do the many diagrams where a shaded loop here is a hetron, hetronic loop, and the non-shaded loop here is a, another lepton loop, which can occur. There's also a way, an alternative way of doing this, and this is again doing lattice. Right? And uh, that would again be another talk, uh, and uh, the accuracy that we have reached with the dispersion relation approach means that if you want to do something in lattice QCD that seriously challenges this, slides it for the discussion session if you want, then you need to take into account ultimately that in these hetronic blobs here, there can still be going around photons. Photons which distinguish between the different quark species so therefore, leading to isospin breaking corrections on top of the isospin breaking corrections that you get from different quark masses. So you need to do fantastic to go beyond the percent level, and this is where we stand now. You need to do a fantastic lattice uh, simulation to reach that, but actually I think people are nearly there, and they are, they are chasing us. So, so we have to, to keep going to improve our uh, evaluations, otherwise we will soon be obsolete. Good, so what are we doing? Not yet obsolete. We are doing a dispersion relation, means we are just uh, relying on analyticity, basically, and uh, expressing the imaginary part, uh, the real part by the imaginary part, and uh, integrating over, uh, and then using the optical theorem. Uh, so instead of using the imaginary part, which we may not know either, we use via the optical theorem, the modulus square of the cut amplitude, which is the cross-section. It's a cross-section of a heavy photon, well, a virtual photon, produced in a plus and minus, going to any sort of hetron. Upshot is, you have to solve a dispersion integral, one-dimensional numerical integral with a known kernel function, and the hetronic cross-section as input. That, heavily, that kernel weighs heavily towards the low virtualities of these photons, so the lowest part of your spectrum is the most important one, and about 73% of the total hetronic leading order, hetronic vacuum polarization contribution, so G minus 2, come from the lowest lying channel, which is just two pions produced here. In order to get precision, we need to sum about 30 exclusive channels. Two pions, three pions, more pions, even more pions, even more pions, Kaons, kaons with pions, kaons with more pions, etas with pions, and you name them. Of course, they can be charged and neutral, so it gets really messy. You can't predict that. Not on lattice, you can't predict scattering processes even easily. Your lattice computation goes not via the this sort of dispersion integral. Once we are above a certain threshold, it's your judgment call. Where, where this threshold lies, we can start to use perturbative QCD and using quarks, but certainly not below a value like the tau mass or so. And then we have some narrow resonances to add. We have a challenging data combination because the data for these guys come from all sorts of experiments with different statistics, different systematics, different binning, different energy regions. You must combine the lot with a very reliable systematical and statistical uncertainty Otherwise, to get the absolute precision and reliability of this integral can't be achieved. You also don't want to have a bias in the marrying together all these data. And there are different methods. There's a direct scan where data were taken with tunable energy E plus E minus beams. Uh, 
there were also radiative return measurements where at Mason factories people use that they have fantastic statistics so they can afford to even if they, the machine sits at the given center of mass energy to send off a photon from the initial state and by taking that hence effectively scanning an arbitrary energy range. If you have never heard about this, this is a very neat method was first discovered sort of the radiative return to the set pole at lab 2 for the people who remember these things and uh, is nowadays a heavily used method just to get <coughs> cross sections. There are many details here which I can't do justice to. One is that uh, that cross section really should be a bare cross section. So bare means that no extra effects from extra vacuum polarizations here should enter because they would be called higher order. I would double count things. So I have to use a naked or undressed with respect to vacuum polarization itself cross-section. So the thing becomes a circular numerical problem and I have to basically determine the vacuum polarization from data, then use my own compilation to undress them if it hasn't been done by the experiments already, or double check what they did, and then iterate and numerically it actually converges after very few steps. While it has to be bare with respect to extra vacuum polarization, or running alpha effects, that's the same language. No, it's an another language for the same thing, this way around. I have to keep all final state radiative photons on board. Means if an extra photon is radiated here, even though that's QED, it's not in the QED number, it's only in the hetron plus QED number. So extra photons within that block here have to be kept in the analysis. So when you do lattice without photons, that's a missing bit. When you're taking experimental data, by and large, that's included because they can't cut them off. But some of them, they may have cut off and you have to correct for it. So in the end, the art here is not only the combination but also the treatment of the data. And this is where a lot of experimentalists and theorists have been working together and banging their heads against the, not a brick wall, but against quite hard wall in order to really achieve that percent accuracy. So I have to speed up a bit to show, <coughs> just to come to the final numbers there. So that is the spectrum of hadron production in E plus E minus from below one GeV to very high energies. It starts with the rho and the omega, the, the, the two pion states, then there is a phi, that's the, where, the, where, where the shape psi and the higher resonances sit. And uh, then even higher up you have the epsilon resonances. And between, between the resonance regions you, you, may end, you may have something that is relatively flat and relatively much looking like perturbative QCD, certainly here, where this is not from data but is from perturbative QCD. But here, that is not perturbative QCD. We really need all this data. So that is now the most important channel. And that is a zoom into that funny feature of the row where there is also the omega. And the interference of the row together with the omega gives you this strange shoulder. So we have now, and it's the most important channel, I say, over 70% before I said it's 73, I think, De depending on how you do all your countings. Now, many, many different experiments have measured this and bringing all this together now included uh, really having a fit of 1,000 data points. That, that by itself is not a problem if they fit together, but if they don't fit <laughs> together so well, then the task is to come up with a reliable, not too pessimistic, but not too optimistic error estimate. And this really needs all the available information, including full covariance matrices, and the use of systematic covariance matrices in FITs is something that is very tricky. You easily create a bias, which you can't afford here. So uh, that's our new number that we have, and that is uh, well below a percent uncertainty. So in comparison, the number with my previous student, published in 11, 
was not so different within errors, of course, we haven't made a, a huge change in anything, but we have brought the error down considerably. It's not yet that factor of two that we were tasked, but it's a, it's, a, it's a most important bit of this already. If there is tension between data, we have to locally inflate. There is a particle data group prescription of how to do that. Of course, that is also not uh, rocket science, but uh, that is a bit ad hoc. And the statistical interpretations of these things, which are partly systematics dominated, is of course an issue. So people keep discussing these details, for example, in the framework of this theory initiative for G minus two. So an outlier is the bar bar measurement. That's a combination in the two pi channel. And uh, we can still squeeze that with a good overall chi square, but you can show what effects this has. So there are new experiments uh, there is actually a further analysis of old but not yet analyzed bar bar data ongoing and there is data from an experiment in Novosibirsk CMD3 which is, has promised coming out but has not come out yet so that's all in the it's all in the pipeline still so this picture could still change but it's in a way the yellow band here is a pretty good representation of the whole lot when you take into account the correlations and the uncertainties from statistics and systematics so other channels I have to go over quickly, we have a three pi channel. So you have the omega, you have the phi, uh, that is how they decay then typically into the three pi. So you, you measure the three pi, that's your final state that you measure. That's all very much suppressed compared to the two pi channel, but you need everything in order to get below a percent precision. So the phi is we don't take resonance parametrizations because God knows what, they, what the right parametrization would be and then how to estimate the uncertainty from a prior of the parametrization formula. We really integrate data. So these zooms are now into the peaks. So the omega is really resolved by these very finely binning, binned E plus E minus can experiments. And that's the same for the phi. So we, we are really having a data-driven approach here as a theorist. So from theory to art, I asked Alex to make something that we could plot at the back of a t-shirt. And he came up with the full hetronic R ratio, that's just a normalized E plus E minus two hetrons cross section, showing all the different channels that he has used there, opening up at higher and higher energy, uh, and the highest cross section as the background color is the sum of them all, and then you have the two pi, and uh, it's a nice picture. Of, of course, it's useless to use, but it's <laughs> nice to look at. Use, more useful is if you then look at the uncertainties and where the dominant errors come from. Do you have a t-shirt? Sorry? Have you done the t-shirt? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is something you do about e inclusive data, and that's possibly for an offline discussion. Is there a glue ball hiding there between perturbative QCD and what's measured in the data? I don't know. We use the data and are happy with it, whatever it throws at us. So that brings me to the combination of all the channels there. And then we end up with a number, and different groups end up with a slightly different number. And this is a result that was published in 03. And that, uh, these are the results that were published in 17 and 18 now, this year. And we home in, uh, well, we plot, of course, our thing as the baseline, our newest thing, not only because it's the latest, but because we believe we have, it's, it's the, most, uh, the most recent one, having all the data as input. And because we believe our way of bringing the data together and making an error estimate, so the uncertainty now in this data-driven analysis, so we came from something of an error with four and have brought it down. All the thing I discussed before was the two pion channel, but we have many others. So we nearly achieved that. Well, it's not, no, it's not really nearly. It's not yet there, but it's, it's not a factor of two yet. But it's a significant improvement from the original error to this. And the composition is statistical systematic, so it's systematic dominated. And then we have still some radiative corrections uncertainty where we have to decide how reliable is what we do to the data. And that still adds a bit, but it has got much better. So cakes are always nice. Sometimes we can have, uh, uh, we can have and eat them. So the value is important, but more important is its uncertainty. And the uncertainty, so that's the error squared cake diagram, is really coming nearly three quarters from this area below one GV. And then at higher virtualities, the errors get smaller, so do the contributions. So really, if we want to improve further, we rely on these very low-lying states, mostly the two pi. 
two pi dominance in this business. So that's, it's time to bring together all the contributions. So we have, the, and this is a, these are slides I stole from my collaborator. So he compiled then what we did into 2011 and what we did now, how the error has changed. There were even changes in the QED. And what you see, this is now all on a common, uh, on a common 10 to minus 10 normalization. So QED is really the most important, but the error is fantastic. But is this QED keeping into account the definition of alpha as well? So the, the change for the alpha from the... This, this slide, not yet. But for the muon, this is negligible. Okay. So it's that is only important. Part. Within these errors, the changes are negligible for the muon. They are only important for the electron. So the electroweak, that's also the old number that I'm using here, but the change is not drastic. That is significant. We are seeing electroweak contributions in there for sure. They are not enough to, to give the number. We are having uh, then light by light, which is uh, ballpark wise the same NLO order of magnitude. And then we had even higher order light by light. So that's a small change. The change in here will actually be like the change here that came when adding this number. So 9.8 was the Glasgow. Yes, 9.8 is the Glasgow uh, consensus. That's a 98 in the other units. Now, we, we brought slight, the mean value went slightly down. More importantly, the error went down a lot. At the same time, we redid the calculation for this. We added, um, we could do it ourselves, but we, we have Matthias having doing this. And uh, the total theory ends up with this number. The total experiment is that. And uh, the discrepancy has slightly widened uh, but the error has gone slightly down. This is then all adding in quadrature. So what is a big change in one number is not a big change in the overall number. But what used to be just a bit above three is now really direction for sigma already. That's not a discovery, but it's for sure what I call a consolidation. So that's where we stand. So we have a 3.7 sigma between theory and experiment. And now if we keep the same mean value and they keep the same mean value, we, we would have seven already now. So seven to eight, if we can bring this further down. Of course, this error is now much smaller than this error. So in a way, mm -hmm. the ball would be back to theory. But first experiment has to deliver. Let's come to the experiment for a few minutes. Can I still have a few minutes for the experiment? Yes. So I'm a theorist. So I'm presenting this on somebody, well, somebody else's behalf, sort of. Not really. I'm also a member of the experiment. So I, I think I'm, so it's more than fair that I show a few slides. But I also rely on slides from a different experiment, because there are now two. I stole them from Tutomo. The other two are Lee Roberts, you may know. He's a very distinguished scientist. And Dave Caval is also a G-2 collaboration member who gave recently a talk. So what happens? That's the, what are we measuring, actually? It's, I think it's interesting for, if you have never thought about this before, it's quite interesting what it really means. Why is g minus 2 such a good quantity? It's such a good quantity because you measure a frequency. All things that are measured extremely precisely, nearly all, I think, are measured from frequency measurements. Because then with interferometry, you can get things very, very precise. And you can do it over many, many, many periods, and that makes it precise in this case. But what do we have to do? We have an MU and we have a magnetic field. And the nice thing here is that the precession frequency, that's the guy that you measure, is directly proportional to the product of the two. But we are having charged particles moving fast in a magnetic field to have uh, the whole effect seen. So that gives us also an electric field. So how to how, and, uh, and that uh, gives you possibly a big spoiler here. That's been dealt with in the Brookhaven experiment by choosing a magic gamma factor, relativistic factor for the muons, means picking a specific momentum so that this is cancelled out. And the eta is the EDM, and the EDM is supposed to be very small, so that factor is supposed to be very small and cannot really spoil that. The Japanese guys are going to do something different. They do, ah, by the way, this E field is needed for, for keeping uh, everything focused. You can't have without, otherwise you defocus too fast. 
So the Japanese guys do something different. They say do away with the E-field. They have no E-field at all in their apparatus. This leads to a completely different experiment, which I will show in a second. So they will measure, again, therefore mostly that, but they will also measure, measure the EDM. So we hope to get a very good EDM measurement as well at Fermilab. So what happens? You start with protons, therefore you have to be at a machine where you have plenty of protons. You shoot the protons on a target, you get pions at Fermilab with a very specific magic momentum of 3.1 GV over C. That's experimental units, they can't put C to 1. So then you have to have a special magnet which allows the muons, which come from the pion decay, to get into here. It makes a difference for your systematics if you still have pions in the ring, that's no good. That's a change at Fermilab, where they have a much longer decay line for the pions, so that they have all decayed when you inject things. And then you have to kick them on the right orbit, and then they keep going round and processing, and this is what you measure, and you measure it through the decays of the electrons, which all end inwards, basically, and you measure them with calorimeters and a few tracking stations, which I can be proud of because they were built in Liverpool, not by me. My PhD student helped build one. So, the Japanese have something incredibly complicated in order to get the muons. They also start with protons, they have pions, the pions decay into muons, so far so good. But they need, the muons are all over the place in phase space, and they need to phase space condense them. So this is what they call cooling. The muon cooling is completely crazy. What they do is, what they tend, uh, what they plan to do, they track, they trap the muons in a, what they call silica jail, something like that. And so the muons, get trapped there, find an electron to partner with, and uh, then uh, you have actually muonium. And then this muonium comes out and they have to make big experimental tricks to get enough of them. And then, because you need muons, you have uh, to ionize them again by shooting laser of a particular wavelength. Right? And even though they do this complicated thing, they get an ultra-cold muon. Ultra-cold means condensed in phase space, so that they are not all over the place, because otherwise you don't get accuracy. That's a layman's version of it. It's, of course, a talk on its own to really uh, explain that. They have a beam line, and their experiment is not as big as a hall, but this is a typical person. I'm not sure if Japanese or not, but it makes not a big difference. It's just a very small thing. It's a tabletop experiment. Of course, in the hall, it won't look like that. Let's zoom in on that technical graph that they have. Their muons have no electric field. What they will do, they are injected at an angle. They will just spiral down in the magnetic field until their death. Completely different experiment. Now, what are we measuring? We are measuring frequencies. We are measuring a wiggle plot. We are fitting an omega frequency which is the omega that comes from the anomaly directly. That's the beauty in this experiment. And on top of that, there is an asymmetry which measures the EDM, which I'm not going to further talk about. That thing is not science fiction. That is reality at J Park. So uh, that is not too far away from KEK. And when the tsunami hit, they had also quite a bit of problems here. It was amazing how fast they could recover. They have completely destroyed infrastructure. They have machines where in the front it eats the old road and in the back it, the new road comes out, including the infrastructure in there. It's, it's unbelievable. They have also a beam line, partly ready, but that's as much as I can say about in the limited time about the Japanese experiment. It's not ready yet. It will take a few more years. Let's go to just a few slides about Brookhaven. The ring was at Brookhaven, was brought on a barge, was shipped around here, sometimes taking shelter when the weather forecast was no good. They brought it then uh, up the rivers, and uh, ultimately they had to go on a truck again in order to squeeze it to, through toll booths at the, some interstate highways, leading to the, ultimately to the lab. So why Fermilab? Statistics, they get the protons, they get the long decay beam line, they get many muons, so statistics will be very good. That's too much detail for any theorist anyway. 
so I can show a few more pictures. There is not science fiction, we are actually doing the experiment right now. That's the new complex. Uh, that's the ring as it was brought in. That's the ring as it was then further assembled with all the, m the metal, the iron there, in order to give you the right magnetic field. Then this had to be shimmed. We have in the formula omega to be measured. You need to know B to get A. If you don't know B to part per million subpart per million accuracy, you are doomed. So you, you have to have a very high con uniformity of the magnetic field. PhD students were absolutely crucial in this. More than 8,000 fine iron laminates were put in all sorts of different places in the ring, measure this, have a model, redistribute a few thousand. <laughs> well, he's easily said they had to do the work. You really screw these things in there. And finally, they have a fantastic uniformity of the field already much better than at BNL now. Liverpool delivered the main detectors are the, the, the photomultipliers for counting the electrons. In a way, it's a sophisticated counting experiment. But you, for the systematics, you must understand your beam dynamics. And tracking devices were built in Liverpool. These are so-called tracking devices. I forgot to bring one of these straws. They're actually pretty much exactly as long as this. So they're a nice detector devices, which make give you information about where the beam exactly is via the decay electrons, which it measures beautifully. So these are the, you may read, this is the Liverpool logo. So they were really built in Liverpool, not the electronics that was done elsewhere, but all the mechanics stuff and the actual detector. And this is, a, this is how the muons will see this, okay? They fly around here, and if an electron comes out from the muon decay, a muon gun, then they will hit these score trackers and give you precise position and momentum and everything information in order to control the systematics of the beam. That's just the fit of this, a very early one. That's the Wickel plot. That's an early Wickel plot. That's when they had a party. So you have a high statistics in the beginning and more of mo and more decay. It's exponential decay, so you get the crappy statistics in the end of the tail. But you can fit your omega, and really, the main fit parameter is the omega here, but of course, you don't do one parameter fit. You can imagine there are many more things hidden in here. They do this. And uh, that's one that is more recent. That is progress in 2018, and that already, this is still, this curve is still not a curve done with a drawing <coughs> program, drawing a sine or a cosine, but this is, and it's exponentially, because it's linear on this exponent, on this log scale, okay? It's uh, linearly going down on the log scale. So it really consists of single points here, okay? So, uh, so they have already quite a few muons caught, and now we are analyzing these data and hope to get more statistics. So in the beginning, the DAC, the data acquisition system, was sometimes playing up. So the protons on target should produce always some muons, but we catch only a part. And now things have been fixed, and now we are catching basically everything we could do. So that's where we are. Uh, that's where we want to be. If uh, my experimental colleagues can't do better, at the current rate, we would end only here, but it's not a suppressed zero. It starts at a zero, so it's not too bad. Uh, better kickers, better quads, better all other. They shut down in the moment, building things in, and a new inflector, and this is the way to TDR goal. Well, I'm out of time. There is a lot of new physics possibility to talk, uh, well, could fill an extra talk. People were excited about this because in SUSE you can have simple one-loop diagrams with which with an enhancement of tan beta over many other new physics scenarios give you about the right size <coughs> to fill the gap. And uh, unfortunately, this scenario is nearly dead uh, because it would require SUSE partners in the mass reach that has already been excluded by the LHC. But we should be careful. History has told us the top was originally thought to be maybe a 10 GV, then a 20, then a 40, then an 80, and they found it about 160. It's not exactly true, but it's not so wrong. The Higgs was only found, was not found at the Tabatron, where politicians were made believe it could be there. It could have been there, but it wasn't. It needed the LHC. 
there's no guarantee that we don't have a more complicated scenario. First of all, SUSE doesn't have to be minimal. It could have a more complicated Higgs sector, which, which gives you a different formula here. It could have a much large mass splittings. The LHC is basically a hadron machine only. So if it couples, if SUSE doesn't couple very strongly to hadron stuff, but more to leptons, and if you have light as <coughs> leptons, you could still do that. So it could, in other words, be heterophobic, but leptophilic for the Greek people. Or not to be there at all, but maybe it's too early to write it off. So many scenarios, also the resurrection of the leptoquark, maybe not quite, but possibilities. You can look at light set primes, you can look like at axion-like particles, at dark photons, and all these things, sometimes even in suppressed diagrams, where you have then extra things in the next to leading order bit. A lot of papers have been written in the past on this and right in up to the presence where people came up with ideas. Remember the beginning of the talk, I talked about AE, where we have a discrepancy but now in the other direction. Now people are thinking about a solution of uh, the tail of the two anomalies by having an obscure BSM scenario which solves for the electron in one direction and for the muon in the other direction. I think the verdict on these things that's not published yet, that is published, I looked the references up, so it's very recent. The verdict on these things is out. It's not yet there. We don't have a, a confirm, a real confirmation of the electrons anomaly, but still it keeps uh, us theoreticians busy, and I, I think that <laughs> must be a good thing. So, conclusions and outlook. Sorry, I'm already way over time, but I want the the bring home messages to be clear, and this is that I believe that the G minus two discrepancy is really consolidated now. Unless the experiment, the new experiment, would bring a really different mean value, which you can never exclude. This is why these new experiments are being done. <coughs> so the uncertainty, the leading uncertainty from the hadronic contributions will still be much further scrutinized. They are in the moment the bottleneck and they will be in the future, that's for sure. Uh, specifically the light by light, which will become the main, the main driver of the error if we improve the rest even more. But I believe that the theory is ready already now for the next round. So the experiment has started, one of them. The other one will take a few years more. The task is to bring the error down by a factor of four. And uh, I hope that with the two different experiments, which are having a completely different systematics and completely different setup and working at different momenta, that's important from the theoretical point of view, I hope that we will get closure, confirmation or, or solution of it either way around. So we may just see the beginning of a new puzzle with AE. Uh, it will be interesting to watch also the EDM bounds. I think there is a complementarity between the, the magnetic and the electric dipole moments, but then also the lepton flavor violation, which uh, where a lot of experiments are in the future coming on. So this is a very, very vibrant field. And uh, not only from the experimental side, but also, but of course what I had to cut short a bit was uh, these many approaches which try to explain the discrepancies. And many of them are now starting to link the different observables together. And that then, of course, also includes the flavor sector, which I haven't talked about at all. <coughs> Thank you. So, that was before the experiment. So, so these... Uh, no, I was referring to um, when you showed from 2011 to today uh, the improvement uh, in the computation of the different contribution. The slide that you took from your collaborator. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, that was just a summary. All of those. Yes, that one. Yeah, it did. Well, that's the different contributions, completely different methods for the different contributions. That is perturbative QED, up to five loop. That is 
perturbative electro week up to including two loop. Actually, they have some higher order estimates in there, but they are, they are sub -leading. Then we have light by light. This is what I call Glasgow consensus. This is modeling of these pseudoscalar exchanges where in the future, hopefully, lattice will play an important role. But also dispersion relations of a much more complicated kind where you don't have just a simple one-dimensional integral but something more to do. Then there are some estimates which are based on the leading order which give you a scaling of that with additional contributions. And then is the main part of the talk was the HPP stands for hydronic vacuum polarization. This is data driven. So it's all no so this is non-perturbative and this is non-perturbative. So the guys which come with the biggest uncertainty are all relative or absolute are coming from the non-perturbative calculations. So this is model driven so far will be lattice driven and dispersion driven in the future. This is purely data driven including this because they're actually Matthias is just using our data combination. So the data that need to be improved there is mostly the e plus e minus goes to pi plus pi minus. And this is where I said there is already new analyses underway and then sort of I have seen plots but they are not the final plots. The most important thing is getting the systematics right is not there yet and there is no saying how long it really takes when you deal with sub percent uh, analysis of systematic errors of a complicated experiment. Also it's small numbers of people working on these things. It's not mainstream LHC physics, so you have a handful of people here, a handful of their maximum. So taking all that together is therefore a mixed bag of where the uncertainties come from, but mostly the uncertainty is really coming in from the input data that we are using and from the modeling uncertainty here, which will soon be lattice uncertainty, plus uncertainty from the people who do it dispersion relation and then again it will basically affect the same data that we are using. And the improvement of the lattice computation is coming from the isospin breaking correction and what else? You may replace these numbers ultimately by lattice and then for the hedronic vacuum polarization because we have percent, percent precision sub percent now, then details in the treatment on the lattice, including photons ultimately and including disconnected diagrams, we talked about them, including really uh, a 2 plus 1 plus 1 simulation and things like that, controlling your systematics, all that thing finite size, all things, all your standard continuum extrapolation, all these things become really important on the percent level. For light by light, where you can afford a much bigger percentage uncertainty and still improve, it is different. There, I think even a very crude lattice calculation, which gives you an input independent of these numbers, will be, will be uh, celebrated as a big success of lattice QCD. Of course, simulating, simulating, that thing in QCD is much more complicated than simulating that thing. So a lot of people were trying, were saying, let's first understand the vacuum polarization and then move to there. But of course, it's a bit of moving goalpost because uh, the other methods here are very precise, whereas here, for a long time, there was nothing but the model calculations, which of course people had reservations about. Uh, okay, great. So. Uh I guess uh, we'll end the question session now. So if people have formal questions, they can ask uh, uh, at the session. Let's thank Tom again for my talk. Discu open discussion session. That's the, that's the lattice for the vacuum polarization. A slide from Christoph Lehner. So, so that's, that, that, that's our number, and that's the other dispersion relation numbers. That's the lattice numbers, and that's when Christoph used his lattice stuff, but together with numbers from this guy. Yeah. So uh, it's, 
it's impressive, but taken on its own, the lattice in the moment here can't match our work units. I have a very dumb question. Sorry, tangential. That's um, why is the uh, are these atomic physics uh, experiments?